six individuals today who have agreed to come and share some of their experiences and ideas with you under the session theme of actualizing indigenous values and methodologies in ethics, policy making, and practice. Um, but really, as I said before, this is a continuation of the conversation. It's a progression. And so um, what we discuss now, I'm sure there will be connections to what we, we started right from the beginning. The purpose of this session is to understand how indigenous values and methodologies inform policies and practices implemented by universities, researchers, and Aboriginal communities, drawing on conceptual approaches and practical examples. And we have six people. We have Dr. Margaret Kovach or Maggie from the College of Education at the University of Saskatchewan. We have Eugenie Lamb from the University of Victoria Research Ethics Office. We have Yvonne Zinzina. Oops. Sorry, we have Sean Haynes. I'm going to change my order. Sean Haynes from the Edmonton Public Schools. We have Yvonne Zinzina from the University of Saskatchewan. She's a graduate mm -hmm. student there, but she's also um, uh, a seasoned <coughs> policy. Um, analyst and uh, at an international level in biodiversity. And we also have Eli Enns, who is, Eli has so many titles. He's the Indigenous Community Conserved Areas Consortium Tribal Parks Coordinator for North America. Sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> He's very forgiving. And, um, uh, John Welch, who is a SFU professor in archaeology and natural resource management. Mm. And resource and environmental management. Resource and environmental management. Mm. And so um, with this, we're going to have our um, speakers again do presentations. Some are using PowerPoint, some aren't. I can't remember who's doing what. Some people will come to the podium and speak. Some people will um, sit in their seats. Some people might sing. I don't know what's going to come out. So um, as they wish, um, we're going to have a, a set of contributions here. Um, everyone trying their best. It's six to the 12 minute mark. And we have, oh, our time angels at the back, and Catherine Bell, and again, Rebecca Rasta. Thank you. Nicole, Eugenie, Eugenie Lamb, you up, speaking about when research involves indigenous communities, how can research and explorers contribute to climate change? Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to thank Kelly and the organizers of iPinch in this conference for inviting me, and um, for the elders who had a wonderful workshop yesterday, and for your wise words um, from this morning. They've been very inspiring and um, you know, given me the courage to, to share some of um, my thoughts and my worries about um, where research ethics is and um, how research ethics boards can play a role of support rather than a role of um, additional harm and sort of bureaucratic harm on researchers in those communities. I um, just want to start with the landscape here. Landscape is really important um, in talking about the work that we do in universities. Um, sometimes they seem like monolithic structures, but there are sub landscapes within universities and the University of Victoria um, is no exception to that. Um, UVic is located on the Coast Salish and Strait Salish territory. Right now there are 2,000 students who attend and um, just to summarize the university's 50 years uh, in as a academic institution um, we are seeing now that it, it has a history of um, commitment to indigenous academic programs and um, research. And this commitment and those growth of those programs um, are pushing on the research ethics boards to really think what, what are we doing and how are we doing this work in a way that supports and contributes positively um, when I started in this office in 2005, there were already many uh, world-class programs going on, and those have just multiplied into more cross-disciplinary programs. So some of them, for example, are the uh, Lelangit program, which is a um, post-secondary program to support more Indigenous students attending and staying at the university and completing their degree. And um, we also have an Indigenous language revitalization <coughs> program that crosses over between um, Department of Linguistics and Education. 
We also have um, the Office of Indigenous Affairs and Office of Community University Partnerships. Um, and all of this is really um, trying to illustrate for you um, a commitment that research can and ought to be done in a different way. Research that is community-focused, participant-centered, and takes into consideration all the different people and organizations and their values. Um, that, that isn't to say that the university has perfectly reached a point where it can just rest on its laurels and say that, that we've done it. And, and I think that I can say that from the university's research ethics board, um, you know, we're, we're probably always a couple of paces behind what the researchers are doing and especially what the graduate students are doing. So um, I'm not really a statistical researcher, but I thought statistics give people an idea about um, what's going on. Um, between 2005 and 2014, here is just a, a sample, and for those of you who can't see this, um, this table uh, that our assistant pulled together, it's really looking at the growth of research that um, we could say was, um, had the keyword Aboriginal, Indigenous, or um, or First Nation in, in the keyword. So between 2005 and last year, we saw um, these numbers of projects growing from about 2.9% to um, just over 10%. And I think this is the numbers, the actual numbers are higher because what I do know is many of these research projects will not identify themselves with these with these labels. They will actually, um, those researchers are using titles that reflect their own indigenous um, languages. So those have been missed on here. And I would also say that within this table, 60% of those projects that, that we review are from graduate students and postdocs. They are not from, from the established faculty. And I, and I will go back to the role of graduate students because I think that's where we're going to find a lot of um, sort of the, the next wave to, to help institutions, especially ethics boards, do a better work. Um, what we've also seen within this is that um, in between 2005 and 2015, where we are now, uh, I've seen uh, a real change in the type of research that involves Aboriginal communities. Initially, we saw that research being conducted by non-Aboriginal researchers with communities. And now that's growing into studies where if someone is non-Aboriginal, they're partnering with experienced um, non-Aboriginal and Aboriginal researchers. And I would say in the last couple of years, what we're also seeing is research um, that is being conducted by, for, about, um, Aboriginal communities. So the researchers are coming from those communities and they want to build capacity within those communities. And that's the kind of research that I also worry about. Um, how are ethics boards serving those types of researchers? What kinds of barriers are we creating by not changing what we're doing and asking them different client kinds of questions? And one of the touchstones that I'd like to sort of stop and pause here is chapter 9. There's a wonderful phrase here, and it says that the chapter 9 is not intended to override or replace ethical guidance offered by Aboriginal peoples themselves. I think this is a call to research ethics boards to say, where does your knowledge end, and where do Aboriginal researchers' knowledge begin, and, and how do we integrate that into the process? So, in my reading of chapter nine, I think the key piece that's been in touch, but that's been touched upon, is the one about community engagement. And I'll just like to talk a little bit about, um, you know, how how do research ethics board understand community engagement, and um, how do we ask the researcher questions about engagement? And when I say researcher, the researcher is not a disembodied researcher. The researcher comes with a story. The researcher is gendered, racialized, or Aboriginal. And I think ethics boards forget about that 
when they look at this paper that comes across our desk? Who is the researcher? What is their story? What are they bringing to this application form? And what I also see about the application form, and I think Jeff touched on it earlier, is that um, for me personally, um, the application form reflects the institution's story of the research. And it's trying to force the researcher and the Aboriginal researcher to conform to the institution's story, not to their own story. So how do we break out of that? How do we hear that researcher's story and understand it for what it is so that we can, we can ask some questions and, and look to them for guidance? Um, this is very small print and I apologize for that, but in the um, ethics application form at UVic, we have spent many years revising the kinds of questions that we ask researchers. And the one that we ask that is reflecting Chapter 9 is um, also based on um, our understanding of the CIHR guidelines. When do you need consultation? Who should be consulted? So we try to ask those questions to the researcher. And these have been refined over the years by different board members with that knowledge. Um, we also have um, a question here about, um, you know, what is what is engagement? For us, it's about sort of trust and relationship building. It's throughout the life of a project, and it's an orientation that the researcher has. It is not a checkbox that once you check it, you don't have to think about anything else. And one really good question that we ask is, so if you're not doing consultation, how can you conduct ethical research with an Aboriginal community? And I have to say that thankfully most people um, say that they are conducting consultation. We also ask the researcher about the context of their study. And this is again a touchstone of chapter 9, which says ethical review of a proposed study shall be attentive to the specific context of the project and the community involved. So we leave an open-ended question for the researcher to tell us their story. Where are they from? How did this study um, come about? Why is it important to them? And other questions that we have in the application form recognizes that it's important as far as OCAP and Chapter 9 to credit communities and individuals. This gives those Aboriginal researchers a place that they know that, that we understand what they're trying to do. We also provide them with different consent options. We don't impose just one type of consent. And I think this to us, um, there's one part in Chapter 9 that says that the REB should not impose languages and processes that may be experienced as culturally inappropriate and awkward. And at the end, we also ask about archiving research and make sure that the return of that research goes back to those participants and communities. So if we know that this is the kind of research that's happening, we're, we're going to we're gonna ask these questions. Um, there's a lot of practical changes that we've also um, done at UVic. I, I won't get into them, but maybe you can ask me questions. Um, one of them is really to... Um, to try to use the expertise of um, graduate students as advisors. They're, they're the next generation. They, they are um, further ahead. And perhaps with, with the discussions that we've had about um, you know, who can we get to be involved in ethics boards, we've always included um, graduate students, but maybe there, there can be a larger role to play, especially with graduate students from different Aboriginal communities. And, um, just in closing, about contributing positively, um, I don't think there's anything that I can really add, but um, one, of, one of the things that I've thought about um, in the last day is really about sharing the ethical weight with, um, with all people who are involved in, in an ethics, in, in, a, in a collaborative research project. Thank you. Zoom out, I guess, into the international world. We've been talking a lot about the <coughs> policy statement for him too, but 
um, it's not the only policy that a lot of us are aware of or need to um, abide by. So. so thank you, and I'll jump right into it because I want to get to the last slide. <laughs> um, so this is a tale of four UN agreements, and um, I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Saskatchewan, but um, uh, in the school, I should say, in the School of Environment and Sustainability, uh, but I'm also working with the uh, Sustainability and Education Policy Network in the College of Education. So um, and my name tag says I'm Yvonne Vizina, uh, but that's just one identity. Um, I'm also a member of the Métis Nation, a citizen of Earth, and all of the other things. Um, and I had a life before the PhD process, so my entire identity is not just being a PhD student. I don't know how to use this, so. All right. So, if any, we have Lord of the Rings fans in here. There and back again. Um, my story. What brought me to bring this information to you? Yeah, I, I took that photo. I often feel like a little frog in a big swamp. Um, but I, I spent many decades learning from elders, um, First Nations, Métis, and more recently Inuit, um, learning about Earth-based philosophies and really connecting with the words that were shared earlier um, because they're so important. They're the only premise from which I work. But I went to school, I learned some professional skills. Um, for a few years I was the Associate Director of the Aboriginal Education Research Centre at the U of S. Um, I taught school um, and uh, somewhere in there I did a Master's on Traditional Knowledge and Science Education. And I worked with our people. Um, I, I worked with incarcerated people. I worked on reserve. Um, I, I chose not to work in the mainstream because um, it, it didn't fit me. So the life question that I walk, walk through life with is how do we decolonize the way we learn and make decisions about the earth? So although I greatly enjoy teaching in schools and, uh, and, and hope to do that again in the future, um, the experiences made me witness to the truth that schools often fail our students, our people. And the, the answers couldn't be found for me inside the classroom. So um, I went on a journey. And that journey involved working for my nation on environmental issues and intergovernmental issues, um, building relationships. I worked collaboratively with First Nations and Inuit organizations, Inuit uh, indigenous peoples from Russia, Scandinavia, Africa, the Pacific, Asia, and South America. But you know, there's only a handful of the 350 million indigenous people in this world working to make change, positive change at international levels. So in advancing our perspectives, indigenous peoples have to do it because we've had many negative experiences with researchers. And, and as Aboriginal people, we don't want to become that or replicate that ourselves. So to have knowledge that at the international level there are ethical standards of, of work, um, I think is an important part of this, this gathering but also to recognize that not only do a lot of academics not know about them, but most Indigenous people don't know about them either. So I brought, I brought you a few key documents that I hope can facilitate some relationship building and uh, develop principles for collaboration. So what I found along the way is that of course we know that traditional knowledge requires a healthy environment. And with the declining life support systems on Earth, it's an imminent threat to all of us and all of our children and grandchildren. 
So I think in the midst of that, there's a growing awareness of the important role of Indigenous peoples, traditional knowledge, and holistic worldviews in leadership, as opposed to simply being the subjects of study. The UN CBD is an important treaty for Indigenous peoples because it brings useful um, documents that were developed in consultation with Indigenous peoples of the world. And um, I've listed them here, the Agwehu guidelines. And I'm going to look at Marlene because these are Mohawk terms. So um, I struggle with them a bit. So Agwehu meaning all things in creation. The Gari Wa Yi Ri, Code of Ethical Conduct, meaning the proper way, the Nagoya Protocol. And then another UN document that exists at the UN General Assembly level, which is under it, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. I can't talk to you about all of them. They have very long titles. We have links to them all. Um, I'll just mention the, the Agwagu guidelines um, on cultural, environmental, and social impact assessments. I could only find one example where it had actually been applied, and that was in Finland. And they're using it in working with the Sami people um, to develop management processes long term for um, the wilderness areas in Sami territory, <coughs> Sami land. Um, these were developed between 2004, uh, the last one, the Nagoya Protocol, um, was developed, was actually just came into force in 2014 um, at the Conference of the Parties. Many countries haven't signed or ratified the Nagoya Protocol, which protects, uh, well, it's on access to genetic resources and the fair and equitable sharing of benefits arising from the utilization to the Convention on Biodiversity. Um, that's an important one, I think. Canada hasn't signed it um, yet, I'll say. Um, we're considered a, a user country, um, so there's often a reluctance by developed countries to sign these agreements. If it, if it creates any kind of barrier to going and extracting things from other places. But it's important for Indigenous peoples to know about these things because the self-determining autonomous nations you have the right to know about the protections you have at the international level um, that um, exist outside of what our country decides. So, um, wonder. Um, again, with the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, it was uh, adopted by the UN General Assembly in 2007. Canada didn't agree uh, until 2010, despite being directed by Parliament to do so in 2008. Uh, the government simply ignored that direction. So the 46 articles of UNDRIP describe what Indigenous people see as their unique human and Indigenous rights. And I think that researchers and Indigenous peoples should begin any collaboration with a review of UNDRIP. The conclusions... Um, I'm doing okay. Uh, pardon? Okay. So, um, Indigenous peoples are working locally and beyond to evoke change. And I think it's important that traditional knowledge is not considered just a small local issue. Uh, TCPS 2014 draws on uh, UN and many other standards. But like all research, especially with ethical research, I encourage you to dig down beyond that find out what are the other sources, what are the other sources that are feeding into that, that are existing, that may not be fully reflected. Um, thinking holistically while recognizing and being proficient with component parts, the particles. 
building capacity. This is hard for all. It's especially hard for Indigenous peoples who are among the world's poorest. At the international levels, North American Indigenous peoples have access to the fewest resources and we're pitied at international levels because we don't have the resources to even do what people in third world or developing countries are doing. This photograph was taken in Hyderabad, India in 2012. I was pleased to have been elected co-chair of the Indigenous Forum. Um, it's just a few of us there. Um, with the co with uh, my co-chair from Ecuador. And um, we're, we work so hard and we're, we're not all academics. There's veterinarians, there's tribal chiefs, there's uh, land managers. Everyone brings to the table what they can. So, my journey has taken me from the classroom to the UN and back again. But I still have the question, how do we decolonize the way we learn and make decisions about the earth? And I have two suggestions. One, we need to create better entry points to facilitate Indigenous peoples' inclusion on environmental issues through disciplinary, multidisciplinary, and transdisciplinary work. And we've been talking about that already for a long time here. The second thing is we need to grow a national network for Aboriginal peoples to work collaboratively on environmental sustainability processes, drawing on international law and standards. And I think probably, I mean, this is from my perspective, but as a plug-in to that, this is where you, you, you could end up with a network of people who also can deal with um, the tidal wave of policy and legislation, uh, you know, uh, uh, on, on, on um, ethics. So the work is complex and would benefit from diverse involvement. There's room for everybody. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the conference organizers and the iPinch people for bringing us all together. Very honored to have been here listening to you. And um, there's all the references. And thank you very much. Thank you, Yvonne. Very thought provoking and really um, wonderful addition to our discussion today. I'd like to call on Sean Haynes, one of our elders. She's a, she's a clinical psychologist. No, I've retired a little bit on that. <laughs> <laughs> she's an educator. She's a traditional person. We're honored to have you here. Thank you. I want to share a case study. I Hopefully I'll have time for two. Um, when peace is involved with youth, 100% of severe conduct disorder students Many with mental health issues were successful on their diploma exams for six years. For three years in a row, 100% of the Aboriginal students in an urban school stayed in school, first time in Canada. What did I do? I used the peace process. That's all it took. I'll give you an example. I'm in my classroom with a PowerPoint presentation, all set to teach social studies, grade 12. And they come flying in the classroom, Dr. Haynes, we need the peace process. And they go, oh, well, okay, well, you know, social 12 is out the door for a minute. <laughs> what happened? Oh, those trans, trans lighters, right? I said, I can't peace process with you. I don't understand you. Oh, can we help you, Dr. Haynes? Well, sure, I need your help. So they began a PowerPoint presentation I still have. Smoke big language for old people. <laughs> and they taught me. They taught me about, it didn't help the Health Act, you know, where you're not supposed to share. And it was all just tobacco illegal, whatever. <laughs> uh, but they were off school property. But... Um, <laughs> So I learned, so I asked the question, so a deuce means you share a cigarette? Yes. Well, what if you're always broke? Well, that's okay, we're all poor. Mm -hmm. um, 
What if I'm like Asian or African or, you know, I don't know, um, Scandinavian or all. No, no, that's okay, we're all broke. <laughs> what if I'm older? Oh, that matters. You can't ask the older students for your smokes too much. Well, that's good to know. Uh, what's lighter's right? Well, that means if you don't have a smoke, you can, um, and, but you have the lighter, you can ask for deuce and share the cigarette and light the cigarette. Oh, it's, it's pretty complicated stuff. I'm not sure I'm ready for the peace process yet. Um, can I ask a couple of questions? Sure, Dr. Ains. I have a doctoral student. A doctoral kind of question I need to ask you. Is it possible that our most troubled youth understand peace? Well, yeah, we know how to do the peace process. I said, well, then fix it. And then they figured out they had to go solve the problem themselves. <laughs> A few days later, the youth began to share how they led the peace process outside the school. These are severe conduct disorder students. I don't need to share any more about their life. But they claimed it. And in troubled situations, they would share stories like saying, you know, when I get into trouble like that out there, I don't need to know I got earmuffs. I just say that's not our way and walk away. They found traction and have gone to college. For the first time in the history of our world, we have youth summits. Are we ready? If you think of that impact of those students, we were lining up for graduation. I said, how many of us are FASD? Okay, let's go ahead. Um, the ripple effect of a moment in time, we have not really studied. I'm too busy helping the students mm -hmm. to study five years later. What impact did this have on the court system? Mm -hmm. now, we had the native counselors and the probation officers and the youth workers from the courtroom come in immediately after the kids in court and contain that dialogue with the youth. What was the impact on health? What was the impact on children's services? What was the impact on education? Well, they got their diploma. What was the impact on advanced education when well, they got there? What was the impact on the world of work? <coughs> Another case study. Sean, can you study why Aboriginal students drop out of school? Okay. <laughs> so I thought I'd ask the experts. I asked the students two questions. Why do we drop out of school? So they gave me five things, and I don't have time to do all of that. How do we fix it? I asked two schools the same question. They gave me the same answers. <laughs> I think I'll just do what you said. So we did. We went from two graduates to 63 in one year. They asked me, Dr. Hintz, could we invite non-Aboriginal people? I said, well, I don't know, it's a risky area, Mill Woods, Edmonton. <laughs> <laughs> I will not make that decision, you must. Let me know when you're ready. So we did. And as we're riding horses, which, you know, I would hear comments from a student who is seeing, Dr. Heats, I've only ever ridden a camel before. And the native students go, <laughs> but we got off the horses and then we ate together and we walked across the stage together. What was the impact on law, health, children's services, education, advanced education and work? When we took our Aboriginal students by the van load to the University of Alberta to register. So I asked the government people, they're still, you know, working with me patiently. We have a knowledge mobility problem. How do we fix it? How do you see nine years of perfection 
and the youth are out there on the streets needing this, we have a knowledge mobility problem. The peace process works. It gives our youth traction. They own it, they claim it. I've even had students do a peace process with the staff. I need to bring Mr. So-and-so in, we need the peace process. I had the student go up to a supply teacher saying, Dr. Haynes, I had to teach them about sovereignty. They just didn't get it. <laughs> we spent six weeks on sovereignty. The ability to stand on our feet and respect a person's right to stand on their feet too. We have a new way of dealing with workplace bullying. No, this is a respectful work environment. That's it. That's easy. No, this is a respectful work environment. We don't have posters for it yet, but it works with the kids. Next slide, please. And what happens when peace is included? We teach the students sovereignty, finding their own feet and strength. We gather wisdom from the experience, and all of them know the grace. Oh, she another adult that hasn't figured that out. Can you teach them too? They have a way of grace with them in their own way, because that is our way. We're learning together. The key term for the youth was, is it done in the room? Is it done? Yeah, it's done, Dr. Ian. No, no, no. Is it done, done? So I don't see any blood out there in the streets. Yep, it's done, done. And that's an important term the youth get. So when they sort it out in their own way, it's done, done. That's how simple it was. Indigenous research, I'll run at the time, and Catherine Lobar, maybe over there, will remind me. <laughs> University of Alberta Law. This is what came out of the work at Wagner when 100% of the students stayed in school. That's when Daryl Rock and Shirk and their kindness began that process of inviting us to define. The implications, we don't fully understand our own wisdom. I went back 15 years later and asked the teachers, what happened to you when you were teaching physics while we were doing this? Their career, they changed forever. We deepened the peace process in the school to a way that the staff, the administrators, we had four levels of government that we'll never forget the success and they still have traction from a moment in time. Do we have the research capacity to study our own ripple effect? Especially when it comes to success. Because in those days, we all did it. <coughs> but we do have a knowledge mobility problem that we can look at. So in my session later, I'll we'll just I'll share how I did it with the kids. Thank you. Charlotte's going to lead a breakout session at following this, where she's going to take people through the peace process that she referred to. Shauna, are you done? Done? I <laughs> am. <laughs> not, not done, quite done. yet, but I'm going. <laughs> I'm going to ask Eli and to come up and share with us his presentation, untitled. <laughs> On my you version. You wrote the title. I, I did. I have the wrong version. Ah, <laughs> they'll see. There's the title. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, I want to thank all the organizers and Kelly and folks, and I also want to acknowledge the, the Billy family um, from Squamish. Oh, it's a, it's a heavy day. <clears throat> um, it's hard when you lose your own child. And we, I just found out today that the, the Billy family in Squamish is uh, mourning the loss of Diana Billy, so I want to acknowledge their family here. Um, <clears throat> and I'm kind of glad that Kelly bungled my title because uh, breaking news, I'm officially on loan from Unisatine government. 
up in the Namaya Valley. Some of you may, the, may know the Tsilko Teen folks from um, Consultation to Consent in the Supreme Court victory in June of last year. And so I'm working with uh, the Tsilko Teen, both Honey and, and Unisateen, to build their Desigo Tribal Park up in the Namaya Valley. So uh, thank you to their generosity to allow me to be here and share with you. So. <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> oh. and, and I want to uh, thank Marlene for bringing the wampum belt and uh, particularly um, you know I was kind of blown away by all that you've shared in the last couple days and uh, you kind of beat me to the punch on the wampum belt side of things but uh, thankfully you spoke of the wampum of 1615 because I'm going to speak a little bit about the 1764 Treaty at Fort Niagara. But thank you. Um, so I'm going to uh, talk about working better together in research ethics from a new channel social contract theory perspective. And uh, maybe a little bit like Marlene, uh, I grew up not, not uh, with the traditional knowledge from my elders. I, I'm New Chanoth on my father's side of my family. I'm a, I'm a Dutch Mennonite immigrant on my mom's side of the family. And so I was raised by my mom and in the prairies of Manitoba, so far away from the West Coast. Um, I, I later learned about uh, New Channel social contract theory from the elders who hahopad me, so that's the traditional education process, um, later in life. So I rediscovered that. And, and similarly to what you shared, Marlene, these, as I acquired this knowledge, that there was a strong sense that I was relearning some, something that I already had in me. So. I can empathize with you on that uh, front. Um, I, was <clears throat> I was othered by the state at the age of 12 and got involved in street gangs in Manitoba. You probably saw the McLean's Journal article about Winnipeg being the most racist city in Canada. And I experienced a little bit of that myself um, at a young age. And, uh, and I was a bit of a revolutionary in my late teens, in my early 20s. Um, but when I returned home and started to receive the traditional education from my New Chanoth elders, they said something to me that was relieving, in a way, from my revolutionary tendencies, which is, he shookish tsawak. He shookish tsawak in our language means everything is one and everything is interconnected. And so with that I would like to acknowledge all of your ancestors. And I'd like to acknowledge that we're all indigenous to planet Earth. And this is what the old, the old grandmother Mary Hayes taught me. Tsawak Nish. We are all one. It doesn't mean we are all one and you are over there. We are all connected, and we are all indigenous to this planet. And um, as Yvonne said, we're, the life systems that are supporting us on this planet are under threat. So we need to overcome the us-them uh, dynamic very quickly if we're going to you know, get all our paddles and start paddling together um, and, and try to you know, scrape together some biological diversity to support life, continued life here on earth for humanity in the future generations, the future ancestors. Um, <clears throat> the Nichano social contract theory extends ideas of justice and relationship from the human community into the species community in which we share our ecosystem. And so what I'm referring to here is the natural laws that we are all born under, that we live under, and that we will all eventually die under. These are natural laws. The sun-moon crest in New Chanoth is always at the top 
of the totem pole. The totem pole is our constitution. It is our social contract theory. Um, the cycles of the sun and the moon affect everything on earth, including your, um, you know, your frame of mind and your emotional state of well-being. The moon cycles govern our, our ladies and our uh, sexual reproductive cycles. The sun and our relationship with the sun, which is a profound relationship in so many ways, it governs everything on, on earth. So this is the highest law in the social contract of New Chano peoples. <coughs> Uh, one of my great teachers is this gentleman here, Levi Martin, and he said something to me which seemed peculiar at first, which is that knowledge is medicine. And not in the medicine in the kind of way that you'd think about it, where you get a prescription from the doctor and you take your medicine. It's a, it's a kind of energy that upholds your life. And he thanked me when I would ask him questions because he said that my questions form half of the knowledge relationship. So the medicine, the knowledge that comes out of our dialogue is half my question and half the reflection that is generated within him. So it's a reciprocal relationship between Levi and myself. And in Nuchano, the traditional education process, um, Hahopa, would always take place while the young people are consuming your meal. And there's a metaphor that while, while you're eating in the food, you're also eating in the knowledge. And that is only part true. It's, it's a cliche understanding of what's happening. In Nuchano, we understand that eat, ingesting food isn't something you just do to stay alive or because it tastes good. Um, ingesting food is part of relationship with the environment. And at the same time we're receiving education from our elders who are speaking to us, we're also receiving education from our species community. And at a very uh, deep and profound level, we're receiving genetic information. We are Hishakish Tsawak. Everything is one and everything is interconnected. When we bind our own evolutionary course with strong um, community of species that we're co-evolving together, there's a, there's a profound genetic knowledge that's being transferred through the process of ingestion. And that's why we would bind our, our evolution with uh, beings such as the salmon, who are highly evolved and adapted for their environment, profound creatures salt and freshwater beings, fish. So it's a very strong medicine. <clears throat> and even the ancient plants, like the fern here, there is there's ways to unlock the genetic potential of that fern with water and with prayer and, and thoughtfulness. And, and even looking at the <coughs> plant, there's a type of education that happens aesthetically where um, the patterns of growth of the fern, which is a very ancient plant on Earth, um, creates um, a kind of visual mindscape in our, in our gray matter, which will then create a tendency for our thought processes to follow that, to follow those um, visual impressions. Um, so whereas in a city you're looking at hard lines all the time, in the natural environment you're, become, you're getting an aesthetic education and I have a yellow color. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad she beat me to the punch on the wampum belt, and, uh, you know, I'm glad that uh, some of the Iroquois words were shown from the UN Convention on Biological Diversity. There's another funny Iroquois word that we all know. What, what, is, what does the word Canada mean? Village. Uh, pardon? Village. Yes, sir. And you know, the, the naive story of the, the guys didn't know where they were, and the guy said Kanata, and they thought that this place was called Canada. That's a naive story. Um, because the reality is, is that the Iroquois Confederacy was the elder brother to um, King George. This is an example of a recreation of a wampum belt. And these, these uh, wampum belts, I have to enunciate that, these form the highest law of the state. 
So Canada is an international indigenous state, and the treaty relationship, Section 35 of 1982 didn't recognize anything new, it just recognized something that had always been there. And we are an indigenous state, so if you want your ethical indigenous space, here we've got a great country to do that. <laughs> Um, I, I won't go into the whole uh, origin story here, but you know, it, it helps to have a visual representation of um, the wampum forms the crux of the relationship between King George and the indigenous nations, sanctioned and, and witnessed by the Creator. So at that time, you know, when treaties were made, they invoked the Great Spirit and the Creator and God um, to kind of like a marriage ceremony in a way you make a sacred oath of relationship. And you dig down into the deepest corners of your sense of self to say, I'm going to make good on this oath. And that created the opportunity for things such as the British North American Act, the division of powers of section 91 and 92. I'm a political scientist. I studied the state initially because I wanted to deconstruct it, but I've gotten over that. <laughs> and I recognize that um, we have an identity crisis, and I had to go through this myself. And who we are as indigenous peoples is different than my the serial number, the nine-digit number that was you know, assigned to me, is my Indian status card is, is down here. If I think like an Indian, that's all I am. And if I think like, an, like a natural self, that's where I'll be. Uh, tribal parks. I, I tempted some people yesterday that we would talk about tribal parks, so that's all I'm going to say is just tribal parks. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I want to make a shout out to the wolves because they're being unjustly, they're planning to kill a lot of wolves and it's not right. And um, we have old protocols with the wolves. And, and uh, John Ralston Saul talks about a resurgence of indigeneity, and the wolves are coming back too. Chu, mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Eli. One of um, Eli's many hats is he's also a uh, research associate with the Polis Project on ecological governance. Um, so I get to um, work and collaborate with him. <coughs> it's, it's such a great privilege for me. John, John Welch is a professor at SFU, and he's going to talk about sovereignty-driven research ethics beyond baseline compliance, consent, and limitation of liability. <laughs> and whatever else we got to get beyond, I'm not really sure about that. It's always interesting to hear all the different ways that uh, we can come up with uh, different words to talk about the same things one way or another. This is a living proof of that. So. Thanks to all of my fellows here on the, on the panel. And, and, and thanks, of course, to all of you uh, for being here and for the remarkable self-organizing capacities that we're already showing uh, to uh, put together really a great bundle of conversation, kind of jump-started by, by Kelly especially and Olivia and her team, their team. So, you know, I really love uh, Discussants who are able to come up with these dazzling critical insights and somehow come up with the uh, key things that hold everything together as a result of presentations in a session like this and uh, lay bare the critical flaws in people's thinking. And I can't wait for you guys to all fill that role. <laughs> I'm sure that's coming up right after uh, I finish stumbling through what I have to say here. Um, I really am just here to, I think, toss a few ideas into the mix. Uh, and these are really the beginning part of, uh, uh, or the follow-up to an invitation from Kelly to think big and uh, offer visions of desired futures um, in, in this, of course, in this realm of, of uh, indigenous research ethics. So offering up my hopes and dreams, I, I suggest uh, a, a sort of a, a framework or some potential for some ways forward in, in the practical realm of identifying ways to, to contribute in, uh, as researchers and, and folks that, that deal with the research process uh, to indigenous communities and individuals. So Kelly's 
invitation to aspiration led me to a couple of, of questions, kind of, you know, how science fiction always starts with the question, what if? And so I was thinking about, well, this is a different kind of science fiction, or maybe it's research fiction. Uh, what if all academic research engagements with indigenous people and communities went beyond the compliance, consent, and damage avoidance frameworks that dominate the research ethics processes today? What if the ethical balance shifted towards a norm that researchers would, uh, cl would work closely with their hosts and subjects <coughs> to create real benefits for the individuals and communities affected by the research? These questions, of course, are hardly new, uh, and I'm already demonstrating that I'm not a, a scholar or expert on indigenous research ethics the way that many, many of you are. Um, but they, they, these, these, these ideas may already have been considered and, and even rejected. Uh, but I think that nonetheless that they're, they're you know, persistent themes in what we're talking about and worth giving some consideration to, and again, especially by way of some practical matters of, of what we can do in order to uh, bring those desired futures into some, some focus. So, in addition to the disclaimer that I'm not a, an expert in this realm, and have really only been drawn into it on the basis of uh, my work with the iPitch project and <coughs> listening to Kelly and learning a lot from her, and also, you know, sort of harkening back to my experience working as a, a tribal official, where I was the historic preservation officer for the White Mountain Apache tribe for about 15 years. Um, it's really in, in, in that key, I guess, and I, that, that was work I did before I joined the SFU faculty. So it's really in that key that I, I, I am been thinking about how we could move things ahead. Um, and in that role as the Tribes Historic Preservation Office, sir, we were responsible, uh, you know, my office one way or another, and the, the, the team of elders, the cultural advisory team, were responsible for more or less adjudicating uh, research proposals, non-biomedical ones that came to the tribe. Now that we're talking about a pretty good-sized group of people and land, um, 13,000 people on 1.7 million acres of land with lots and lots of history of engagement with, true for most indigenous communities, lots and lots of history of engagement with academic researchers. Um, and so we started applying what became known sort of colloquially as the, uh, the, the Raymond Kane rule to the research proposals that we had the job to, to assess. Um, so you know, like many, most, all of you, this is a fellow that had a particularly uh, potent effect on my way of thinking about things, uh, 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 an awesome elder and uh, mentor for me. And the Raymond Kane, uh, uh, his logic was really that Apaches had been opening their lands and hearts and minds and sometimes veins to academic researchers for more than a century. That Apaches had given a great deal, but had very little to show for it. Same old story. And uh, that was enough. And Raymond's negotiating position with researchers was that he'd like for the Apaches and the tribes to have 99% of all of the benefits that could foreseeably be created from the research. <coughs> but that, with close negotiation, he'd settle for 51%. And that became really the rule and sent most researchers screaming and crying and from you know the negotiating table. And I can't really think of even one that got missed as a result of that. Again, the same old story for many of you. Um, and I never heard any of my Apache colleagues say, gee, I really wish that we had given that researcher the go-ahead to, to proceed. People felt badly because of, a, of an inherent generosity and interest in accommodating outsiders in Apache communities. And um, so there was, you know, momentary feelings of, of uh, ethical lapses for not being good hosts. 
inside the Apache community, but again, nothing that ever sort of stuck with us or with the community. There were a few research teams, however, who accepted the challenge of the Kane rule and rolled up their sleeves to work with Apache partners and tribal officials to try to answer questions about how to make it so research subjects and hosts benefited even more than the academic disciplines and researchers. And the efforts to comply with the Kane rule came to uh, eventually, you know, it started with just that kind of an open-ended invitation, like, you know, prove up, what are you going to do in order to, to, to return benefits? But eventually um, came to require some concerted attention to the needs and interests of, of the community and the individual Apache people in the community in relationship to the individual research proposals. And needless to say, those needs and interests, of course, vary from place to place, from community to community, from sort of research proposal to research proposal. And what I want to suggest and get your feedback on here is the idea that sovereignty offers really as good an initial starting point for the questions about what indigenous and local communities need and want as really any other good starting point. And I certainly recognize the hazards of trying to collapse the desires and requirements of all indigenous people into a single, uh, a single word. Uh, and at the same time, um, I guess just to repeat that my experience has been that many researchers, especially the ones with degree, the most degrees, struggle the most with sovereignty in, in abstract terms. And so it's really been in response to that struggle uh, on the part of the community I worked with and other communities I have worked with since, since uh, days living and working for Apaches. Um, on behalf of that community or those communities and on behalf of you know, my colleagues and uh, as research proponents, that uh, it's come to me that you can use sovereignty and the things that make so up sovereignty as a way of, of, of moving conversations along, of allowing people to stay longer at that negotiating table and try to come up with something that's going to that's gonna work truly in a reciprocal, balanced kind of way. And so uh, that required me to come up with a way of kind of deconstructing sovereignty. What are its constituent parts? What do you mean by helping with sovereignty? How can we boost, enhance, exercise, expand, um, scale, contributions to sovereignty in appropriate ways. So I don't mind you in the next slide. I just have done that, broken it down, and um, come up with one way of doing that. And there are definitely other ways. Uh, but there you have it, sort of five pillars of sovereignty, in my view. Could be five interlocking uh, links that hold people together with land, together with legitimate authority, uh, to perpetuate those relationships into the future. Um, and I just thought it might be useful to try to bring that abstractness down to the ground a little bit by offering ways that, um, that some of the research that I've been involved with through the years, uh, especially in the archaeological realm, has done this uh, in the White Mountain Apache context. So, you know, we sort of pick the self-sufficiency bit and we've got the definitions or one, you know, my definitions for what I think about is, is self-sufficiency, self-determination, self-governance, self-representation, and peer recognition there. Um, and then I've just got some examples, again, to try to make things a little bit more concrete from an archaeological research perspective that we have, for example, in the self-sufficiency realm, done our best to try to help identify and restore old field and agricultural systems to boost self-sufficiency and food sovereignty. Uh, in the realm of uh, self-governance, we've done quite a bit of work to build capacity within a number of different parts of the tribe, but especially in the tribe's heritage program, where my successor is a tribal citizen, and where you know there's seven people working in the heritage program that weren't working there when I first got there. Um, because there wasn't a heritage program. Um, in the domain of self-determination, of establishing ordinances and policies to guide 
the conservation of heritage resources and the perpetuation of Apache cultural traditions. And then uh, in terms of self-representation and restoring ownership to the uh, uh, ownership of the interpretation of Apache history and culture at the Tribes and Museum to Apache cultural bearers <coughs> to make sure that they were in charge of what was being said about them and their forebears. And then finally in the area of peer recognition of helping to create the tribes historic preservation office which excludes the state of Arizona from all jurisdiction over heritage resources on the tribes lands. So um, an example of some way to think about moving ahead with some of this and uh, look forward to your comments and continued collaborations. Thanks so much.